you. I'd like to take a, a minute to, to thank uh, Dr. McGarity, who originally invited me to speak, uh, and as well to the Cult uh, Cultural Knowledge Consortium uh, for hosting this. Um, so today, um, I will be talking primarily about transnational organized crime in Central America, uh, particularly in the three countries that form the, the so-called Northern Triangle, and that's Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Um, I'll be touching upon three interrelated aspects of everyday life in these countries. Um, the first is on the complexity of the current criminal ecosystem in the region um, and how its constituent parts uh, relate to one another. The second has to do more with the actual mechanics of trafficking on the ground level uh, and changes in temporary imbalances uh, that result in sort of elevated uh, levels of violence uh, year to year. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, that is to say, what are, what are the groups involved in? What are the intricacies of what they do? How do drug trafficking routes relate to local atmospherics? Um, specifically for the second point, um, I'll be using the, the, the example of the Zetas incursion into the region uh, around 2009, 2010, uh, when they sort of made their splash in Guatemala. Uh, and the final point uh, will be, a role, be on the role of, of state institutions, particularly uh, the debate surrounding the state's relationship with the criminal, criminal ecosystem, uh, which can be largely described as, as a transactional uh, relationship. Um, so to get started, um, I thought it would be appropriate or even necessary uh, to go over an abbreviated history, uh, and here I'd like to stress abbreviated history, of trafficking in the region, um, especially because in order to help couch some of the larger and later points that I'll be making, observations, um, you know, it's necessary to understand why we're at where we're at now. Needless to say, I mean, this, this sort of short you know, introductory uh, review is not exhaustive. Uh, and in fact, I think one of the, the main driving points that I'd love to get across in this presentation relates to the complexity um, of the regional criminal ecosystem. And, and you, know, you know, five minutes in history or 10 minutes or even an entire day doesn't really do it justice. Um, the current dominance of transnational organized crime groups in Central America over what I think could be referred easily as vast areas of the individual national territories of each of the three countries uh, developed over three distinct stages uh, for probably the better part of the last three decades. Uh, the first came about with the end of the civil wars in the early to mid-1990s uh, when Cold War era proxy groups evolved into rather complex criminal organizations in the new post-war environment, certainly more complex than they were uh, before they became criminal actors. Uh, despite the various peace and demobilization agreements of that era, or sort of early to mid-90s, the fact remains that there were a very large number of militarily trained individuals with access to weapons, access to networks, Clandest, you know, already established clandestine structures for smuggling, for kidnapping, for extortion, um, all of which were left intact and carried on into the new era. Now, the driving force was no longer the Civil War, uh, whichever side you may have fallen on uh, as, as an actor in, in specific countries. The new paradigm was one where you had a skill set, individuals had a skill set that they could then capitalize on. Moreover, deeply rooted socioeconomic grievances uh, were never really fully addressed by neither the Civil War nor the, nor, nor the peace agreements that, that came after. Uh, and long years of civil war and like lack of state presence, um, as, as well as good governance, uh, engendered what has been called cultures of contraband. And that's, that's not my term, but, I, but I'm borrowing it because I think it very aptly describes um, sort of a cultural element of how trafficking was not only accepted, but a part of everyday life and had been for but a part of a century. Um, in this case, what changed was the product being smuggled, not necessarily the actual trafficking structures. Uh, and this is something that is mirrored in these new, in, in sort of new criminal ecosystem that we find in Central America. That is to say, it didn't appear from a vacuum, um, whether, you know, it was cheese in 1925 being smuggled in Guatemala, uh, whether it was cardamom being smuggled uh, in the probably mid-80s to, to early 90s, uh, or there's cocaine in the late 90s, um, the fact remains that the smuggling routes were there from, a, from very early on. 
Um, at the same time, uh, note that this, this era, the second, uh, sorry, this first phase of change in the early 90s came around the same time when the center of power in drug trafficking in the Americas was shifting from Colombia over to Mexico. Remember that the Medellin cartel was dismantled in 1993, and the Cali cartel, which ironically actually helped dismantle the Medellin cartel, uh, follows suit a few years later in 1998. Now, while this is occurring, Central America is still playing the middleman, as it still does today, but the change is that now the, the sort of the masters of the game shift north to geographically be much closer to the Northern Triangle. The second stage uh, of the sort of historical narrative that I'm laying out here uh, came with the development and the evolution of the transportista networks. Uh, and this occurred in the mid 90s to around, I think, 2006. They were you know, fully consolidated. Transportistas uh, is the local name given to sort of the well-established trafficking groups in Central America, particularly the Northern Triangle, uh, which more often than not tend to be crime families. They're not always crime families, but in many cases, uh, you know, they're we sort of think think of a mafia family equivalent. Um, these crime families were, and to some extent, still are uh, the middlemen in the drug trafficking routes from South America to North America. Um, and here, I'm talking about groups such as Los Lorenzanas, uh, Walter Overdick, who, uh, who is, is, I guess his name was El Tigre, um, El Cartel de Texas in El Salvador. I mean, the, the list goes on because each, each locality has a, has a different small group that, that usually uh, does smuggling. Uh, these groups capitalized on their knowledge of existing smuggling routes and, and the vast land holdings in their private hands. Some of these were very wealthy families, which had a lot of land. Uh, and have continued to acquire land. I mean, there's, there's, I've, I've read estimates that anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of land in Central America and the three countries in the Northern Triangle are owned by groups or individuals tied uh, to transportista networks. And so what, what this allowed them was to have places where they could receive and move product uh, with little to no state intervention. I mean, we're talking last fast of of land where that you can land the plane, unload, and reload into a different plane and take off without anybody ever bothering you. Um, cocaine simply just became the product that was going through these networks, um, a particularly profitable one. But the network was already there. Now, the final stage in sort of this abbreviated history, and I'll stress again, abbreviated, um, came uh, about with the war on the cartels in Mexico. And then that, that, you know, that was declared by the then newly elected president of Mexico, Felipe Calderón. Uh, in 2006, uh, and he, you know, he pretty much staked his, his presidential reputation on 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 that. Um, as pressure increased in Mexico, groups such as Los Zetas and the Sinaloa Federation found an easy to operate environment in, in the Northern Triangle, um, and it, it is this relationship between the Mexican transnational organized crime organizations and local transportista groups in Central America. Which brings us to sort of the, the complex and messy, tra messy trafficking structures and the criminal ecosystem that we see operating in the region today. I think a good starting point, you know, that, that's moving on from some of the history major points. I think a good starting point for understanding this complex criminal, criminal ecosystem is a simple illustration of the three main types of groups operating in the region, at least as I see them, or at least as my organization sees them. Uh, this typology is, is by no means meant to be a definitive description of all the types of criminal groups that are out there uh, in Central America. And, and you know, each of these tiers, as you see tier, tier one, tier two, tier three, are not monolithic. I mean, it's simply an illustration that gets the major points across. Um, what we've done here is, is simply to group criminal organizations according to several defining factors such as size, cohesion, place along the trafficking chain, whether you're, you know, whether you're a shipper, whether you're a receiver, whether you're a retailer. So anyways, at the top, we have tier one groups, which are the large Mexican cartels. Um, obviously, th this image is representative of post-2006 environment. Um, as a result of the war on cartels over the last few years, uh, some of these larger organizations have atomized into smaller groups, uh, leaving behind, I think, exclusively the Sinaloa Federation and Los Zetas um, as the two most powerful uh, drug trafficking groups in, in Mexico, and arguably, uh, I, would, I would argue, in the rest of Latin America. 
Um, as it relates to Central America, these tier one groups then contract the services of transfersista groups, which, uh, you know, I, I put a sampling there on the left side in the mid, the, the tier two on the left side. Uh, there's considerably more than those, but uh, I've, I've taken one or two for each country. Um, and, you know, these, these uh, second tier operators, uh, they're second tier because they neither produce the product nor deliver it to its final destination. They're, I mean, essentially a middleman. With very few exceptions, uh, you know, they, they generally do not retail the drug. They may be paid in product, which then they may resell to somebody who is retailing it locally. But by and large, uh, they're, they're a business that's purely involved in trafficking. At the bottom, we find sort of this endless list of, of small groups and gangs throughout the region. Uh, in both in Mexico and in Central America. In the case of Central America specifically, I think it's worth pointing out that, that Maras, uh, be it Maras Salvatrucha, MS-13, or uh, Mara 18, Calle 18, um, they fall in this category despite their large numbers, because these are very large and transnational groups, but there's a, there's a significant difference, and that is that they're fairly flat organizations. Um, with, you know, while a specific clica, and the clicas are the, the specific gang uh, sort of uh, cells, if you will, within within the general Mata structure, um, you know, internally they may be organized hierarchically, but between one clica and another, uh, there is not that same hierarchy that you would observe in a larger drug trafficking organization such as the Sinaloa cartel. This means that while one clica may be doing something. Uh, another clique half away the other, you know, on the other side of the country may be either completely unaware or completely uninterested. Uh, I mean, nothing, nothing in common. So, as such, I've, I've sort of categorized uh, Maras as organizations that do not really play in the lion's share role of the trafficking over large distances. Uh, they certainly play a role in the local narco um, but not necessarily in transporting in the complex logistics. Of course, that is not to say that there are specific clicas which may do that. Um, I'm here simply referring to the organization in general. So this graphics, besides organizing the different groups operating in the, the criminal ecosystem, um, sort of tries to illustrate how there's a criminal technology transfer uh, from the second tier to the third tier, which is, I think, is a result of the exchange of services from one tier to the other. The same occurs between Tier 1 and Tier 2, but perhaps to a lesser extent, I believe. Uh, this discrepancy between sort of the different rates of criminal technology transfer between the different tiers uh, is, in effect, an example of why some groups remain at the bottom. Uh, that is to say, they may not possess the necessary skills or organizational control to perform the tasks that the top, that the top tier needs them to or may contract them for. Um, Groups in the middle, in this case, in this case, the Transrosistas, specifically in Central America, present themselves as, as professional organizations that can be relied upon. Now, recent ground-based interviews that, that we carried out as we were preparing a study um, you know, revealed that the main, sorry, revealed that in many cases, Tier 1 and Tier 2 groups simply do not trust Tier 3 groups to carry out responsibilities, because in many cases, uh, not only are they atomized and they're kind of all over the place, but they simply do they simply lack the organizational capacity, uh, which makes them unpredictable. This unpredictability of, of these smaller, either individually smaller groups, because they may be part of a much larger network, uh, drives us to a very important observation. Trafficking groups um, operate as businesses with, with profit margins to guard and, and, and costs to try and reduce. Um, although cocaine tends to be a very profitable product in terms of gross profits, net profits tend to be overestimated, I think, uh, especially given the growing complexity of the criminal ecosystem and the pressures of non-criminal actors, actors upon both Tier 1 and Tier 2 groups. Uh, whether these be legitimate pressures, such as interdiction efforts, um, or you know, illegitimate pressures, such as the cost of bribes, uh, which you know, Tier 1 or Tier 2 groups may write off as, as you know, the, the cost of doing business is there. Um, the, the driving point here is that to, put, to trust uh, a tier three group 
with a large shipment of cocaine or whatever it is that you, the group may one or two may be uh, smuggling uh, is a bit of a gamble. Uh, and if they're going to be engaged in, in small gangland turf battles, um, that adds a certain cost, a certain risk to what you're trying to transport. And so tier one is not interested in hiring tier three groups. Now tier two groups may be have, they have the difficulty that they may not have as large a network or they may not have uh, you know, as, as, as good staff as, as they may need, and they may need more men, they may, they may need certain things. And so in certain occasions, you see tier two hiring specific groups in tier three. Uh, and you see, it, you see it especially with particular clicas where, where they develop a relationship uh, with certain tier two operators. And what ends up happening is that there's a sort of a process of self-selection where the clicas that are more reliable and can be trusted more because they're somewhat more organized uh, end up learning certain things about trafficking from tier two groups and slowly start to learn how to become more professional. And, and that's, that's a shift that, that's actually fairly recent. We've seen it in the past, I would say, a couple of years. Um, but it certainly suggests a certain direction in which, in which this is going. Uh, I mean, let's remember that, that the Zetas uh, did not start as the top cartel or one of the top cartels. They started as the muscle for the Gulf cartel. Uh, and there's certainly, and this is something I'll touch on later, uh, there's certainly, there was a criminal transfer technology there uh, where they learned their current operation uh, by, by that very same process, by being contracted out to do certain services. All right. So uh, to, to try and get in sort of a, the specific mechanics, um, as, as, the, as the product moves north, uh, and this is a very general map, obviously. It doesn't, you know, the arrows aren't particularly pointing anywhere in specific. It's actually pointing just to the countries. Um, as product moves north, there are a multitude of moving parts that need to go right, essentially, for, for a trafficking group. Uh, with any other multitude of interests and actors that ultimately will exert pressure on, on tier one and tier two groups. Uh, and, and it is this pressure which always makes trafficking, especially the net profits, um, a very difficult operation because there's many moving parts. And so if any of those parts fail, uh, you essentially lose a very large investment. So while the Zetas losing a small shipment may not mean much to their balance sheet, uh, it may mean considerably more to a middleman that was transporting for the Zetas because then all of a sudden uh, they owe the Zetas a shipment and perhaps it was stolen or perhaps it was lost or any, any multiple things could, could happen. Um, and so as, as you move further north, you keep adding complexity to, to the system. Now, the vast majority of products, uh, at least specifically cocaine, because the, the bulk of cocaine that ends up in the United States uh, goes through Central America. Uh, I think a statistics range anywhere between 80 and 90 percent of cocaine in the United States actually goes, goes through these routes. Um, enters through Honduras. Uh, and, and specifically in this case, it enters through the Gracias a Dios uh, part. Departamento, which is a sort of a equivalent of a state, uh, on the uh, on the eastern side of Honduras, you can sort of see it there. It's kind of like a triangular shape. Um, as as shipments arrive, either from Colombia uh, or Venezuela, uh, in certain cases it comes through Nicaragua. As that sort of arrow air route arrow points there, um, there are very few land routes that are still being used all the way from the bottom. Um, there's just too much complexity, I think, and so the the sea routes and the air routes are sort of displaced, I think largely uh, the, the portions before it sort of gets to, to Honduras. Once it gets to Honduras, uh, there are quite, quite a few land routes. Um, it, it moves the product, once it arrives to Gracias a Dios or any of the other departments in the south, uh, starts to move inland with the help of these transportista networks. Um, now, the transport, as I've said, the transportista networks, they have access to small airplanes and, and very vast stretches of land uh, where they can land the planes, where they can fuel up and they can continue. Alternatively, if, if it's not by air, a significant portion of the product sort of hopscotches uh, along the coast on small boats. Now, there's, there's a couple of differences here um, in sort of the, the hopscotching because certain boats may be able to travel much larger distances and so certain groups prefer certain types of boats or prefer certain types of, of operations. So, for example, uh, they, they, the small ones, they call them tiburoneras, which are their 
it's, again, it's like a small boat. Tiburon means shark, so tiburonera is like sharky. Uh, these ca carry actually very small amounts, about 100 to 150 kilos. Um, but there are certain groups that have, you know, greater, greater capital to, to, to expend on, on transportation and operations, and they may use, may use land chests, which are just the word for, for boat. Um, and these, you know, they can carry up to 2,000 kilos of cocaine in, in one go. Now, along each stop, as they stop along the coast, um, there, there's going to be local crews that will very quickly unload and reload during the night. This mostly occurs during the night. And we're talking about crews of 15, 20, even 30 individuals that are paid a fairly small amount. I think usually anywhere between 500 lempiras, which is like, uh, it's like about $30 or so. Uh, they'll, they'll be paid to very quickly unload and then reload back again in a different boat that then does the next leg of the trip. Now, this in of itself is, you know, what I'm describing is already a fairly complex uh, logistical chain because it's not a matter of putting something in a truck and then driving in the same truck all the way. We're talking about a lot of moving parts, a lot of different people, uh, a lot of hands in the pot, let's put it that way. Um, and, you know, along each, along each point, these individuals most likely, or at least in most of the cases, are armed. So, not too long ago, they, they caught a group of, I think it was about 10 of them, uh, unloading and loading a boat. And, you know, they had, a, they were heavily armed. And so the assumption was, oh, of course, these must be Zetas. The, I think there's a, there's a distinction that needs to be made, that just because the Zetas may be present in a particular shipment because they own it and they're protecting it, does not necessarily mean that everybody else who's working in this sort of logistical operation is a you know card carrying member of the Zetas. And that's that's an important distinction to make. Um, so the Zetas may be guarding the product, while the local local transportistas may be carrying out logistics uh, with contracted labor from, from smaller organizations. The point is that despite the multitude of maps one can find on the internet suggesting that one group controls this area or that area, I think the reality is more complex. And so to, to draw, you know, Zetas here on a map is, is, is a little bit deceiving. Uh, from there, once, once you know, moving, moving away from, uh, from Honduras, uh, the, the product either, move forward, the product either moves into Guatemala through uh, Corinto, which is on the northeastern border between Honduras and Guatemala, uh, where generally it's received by Los Mendozas, which is one of the local uh, transportista networks. It's a family-based one. Uh, or may continue inland towards the west, uh, sort of where the, the border of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador meet. And it's a bit difficult to see on this map, um, but it's, I mean, it just gets to the southeast portion uh, where you see those little dangerous municipalities. Um, now, uh, if the shipments are going this land route, they're sort of crossing towards the west, southwest to, before it goes back up. Uh, these are generally received by Cartel de Texas uh, in El Salvador, which is one of the, again, one of the, the larger transportista groups uh, operating there. Um, before it, you know, goes through El Salvador before heading right back up into Guatemala, because ultimately, obviously, the route has to go north. Um, or if it's going directly into uh, Guatemala, you know, it's gone into Honduras, gone sort of southwest, and then it goes right back up into Guatemala without going into El Salvador. Those packages tend to be received by the Florensanas, which is, again, one of the other large uh, transportistas families. Um, you know, and this is just a general description of sort of the actors that are playing a role here and sort of the general routes that they play. Ultimately, I mean, there's hundreds of routes, there's hundreds of variables that change. So um, I think ultimately what is important is to sort of realize the complexity and the, the number of moving parts in the trafficking machinery uh, throughout the region, from north to south. Uh, all of these ultimately are adding up to pressures. And these are internal pressures between different groups, as well as pressures between groups. And a perfect example of these pressures uh, became very evident sometime after the Zetas entered Guatemala. Now, they really didn't make a splash in Guatemala until I think 2009, 2010. The Zetas actually were in Guatemala operating considerably early. I think arguably you could, you could easily say that they were around mid to late 2000s. I think 2006 may be a good, good date to sort of pick. Now, at this point in time, we need to remember that Los Zetas was still the muscle for the Gulf Cartel. Um, they weren't uh, sort of the, the, the organization that they had become. 
uh, and they entered the country with the objective of hiring personnel. Uh, particularly, they were interested in former military, military cabiles, sorry, cabiles. Um, these are sort of the, the local special forces in Guatemala. Uh, of course, the Zetas found a natural partner with them uh, because they themselves, the Zetas themselves, uh, at least the leadership had a very similar background. They had been, you know, they had, they were former members of GAFE, which was a, a Mexican special forces unit called uh, Grupo Aeromóvil Fuerzas Especiales. So. There was already, you know, a natural relationship there. Um, beyond that, their incursion into Guatemala uh, meant that they found a reason and a necessary element to sort of <clears throat> catapult them to the top once they turned against the Gulf Cartel, which they would do a few years afterwards. Uh, what do I mean by this? Um, by by going down to Guatemala and making these contacts, hiring these individuals, they not only became aware of who the operators are, who the actors were, but they realized that they now had access to this vast network, trafficking network, that they, they had access on behalf of the Gulf Cartel. It wasn't the Gulf Cartel that was doing directly. In certain cases, they were, but it, by, invite, by having the Zetas there, what occurred is a really good example of criminal, uh, uh, transfer criminal technology. They learned something they didn't know before, which was trafficking because they were the muscle up at that point. So, the next slide. This map, so following with the discussion, this, this map sort of depicts, I think, a more recent, uh, it captures more, more recent sort of territorial claims, not necessarily claims, but sort of where you're more likely to find one group or another. Um, the, the orange at the top, uh, obviously, being the Zetas, which have sort of spilled over from Mexico. And so the, the other smaller groups uh, tend to be sort of areas, I think, that are, we could call power bases uh, for transportista networks, not necessarily territorial claims. Um, I, I think, again, there needs to be this nuanced distinction between uh, you know, a group operating in a particular area and a group trying to exclusively operate in a particular area, which is what I would refer to territorial, to a territorial group. And so, you know, it depends who you ask. Uh, there may be different opinions, but I think I'll, I'll touch on this in a, in a minute. Um, you know, I, I would argue for, for the sort of more nuanced understanding of how they operate locally, uh, in this case, the Zetas. Um, and I think against sort of all intuition, I would suggest that the Zetas exert a very different type of control and territorial presence uh, in Guatemala and Central America, but in, in Central America than they do in Mexico. Um, this, I mean, of course, this sort of claim kind of goes against much of what has been the debate over how the Zetas operate in Guatemala. Uh, you know, generally speaking, when people think of the, the Zetas' presence in Guatemala, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is usually the brutal ambush and assassination of Juancho Leon. Uh, Juancho was the, the leader of a transportista group uh, called Los Leones, and if you look on this map, it's sort of the yellow area sort of uh, bordering El Salvador, uh, which is now actually not necessarily Los Leones anymore, as formal, former members of Los Leones, because the Zetas uh, very brutally uh, essentially got rid of like eight of them in one go in an ambush, they essentially invited him, they orchestrated a, a meeting uh, and, and, uh, in Zacapa, and they went, his gentleman went into the meeting with an com armed convoy of individuals protecting him, and he got pinned down, and there was a firefight that lasted a few hours, uh, and eventually he was killed. Now, this, in addition to the fight that the Zetas had with the Gulf Cartel uh, in Guatemala, because a lot of the, when there was a falling out between the two groups, a lot of that spilled into Guatemala, is generally presented as, as evidence that Los Zetas is interested in territorial control, exclusive territorial control, uh, because, you know, look, they're, they're having all these operations where they're eliminating all these enemies. Uh, clearly, they're interested in being the exclusive group that controls the country. Um, I would posit that the criminal ecosystem in Guatemala um, and the fact that various transportista groups operated along the Zetas and the Sinaloa Federation and continue to do so suggests a sort of a different kind of relationship. Uh, Juancho, Lido de Leones, uh, he, he was primarily killed off in sort of a spectacular manner because his man had stolen products that was being transported by Los Zetas. Um, this is sort of the, the stealing product that is a common theme 
uh, in Central American trafficking. Uh, it's, it's called, the tactic is used by competing groups and it's called tumbar, which means to knock off. And so you have groups that specialize in, in knocking off, uh, sorry, knocking over certain shipments. They're called tumbadores. Now, by doing that, by Juancho having his man steal a shipment from the Setas back in 2007, what that cost was a certain upset in the balance of the criminal ecosystem. And so the response was to then very forcefully eliminate him, not just to you know, deal with the particular problem that they had at hand, which is somebody stole their product, but rather to send the message of everybody else that you know, we're here and if you steal our stuff, we're going to come after you. So continuously, I mean, we've, we've, we've asked, we've talked to individuals on the ground, um, and in addition to that, the very existence, uh, the, the existence of transportista groups in the country and the region, specifically the country of Guatemala, but just in the region as well, I think suggests that there's a different relationship because if they were really interested in sort of the territorial uh, control, uh, they would have gone after the other groups and that's not really what occurred. I mean, it's been about four years or so and actually more than four years and a lot of these groups are still in operation. I think um, the the, the situation, the nuanced point that I'm trying to make is that the relationship between the Tier 2 groups in Central America and the Tier 1 groups in Mexico uh, is not the same as the relationships that you see in Mexico between Tier 1 and Tier 2 local groups. It's one, one in Central America, is one where exclusivity is not necessarily the name of the game. You may have uh, particularly members of a transportista family that may be doing business with the Sinaloa uh, Federation, and you have, may have other parts of that same family doing business with the Zetas. Um, and there, although there may be cases where there is violence between one or the other groups, because after all, they are criminals, generally speaking, the transportistas present themselves as businessmen. Uh, they present as people that are going to get your product from point A to point B. And so you will hire us to do that job, and it really doesn't come into play whether we're doing something on the side or not, as long as the cartel, the, the, the tier one group, is getting what they were, you know, what they paid for. I think, uh, sort of starting to, to wrap up the points that I've been trying to make, uh, one final aspect of, or consideration, I think, which I had mentioned earlier, uh, is sort of the transactional nature uh, of the relationship between the state and here I'm referring both to, to the individuals in, in, that play a role in politi local politics um, as well as to parts uh, of particular institutions, if, if not whole institutions uh, of the state. Um, the part, sort of the role that they play in the criminal ecosystem, um, particularly with the first and second tiers. Not, not so much necessarily with, with third tiers, uh, in this case Maras, because that's mostly what composes tier, tier three groups in Central America. Um, this, this sort of complexity between that relationship, that transactional relationship, um, is very closely tied to corruption. Um, well, there are very strong indications that successive governments have not only been infiltrated by criminal elements uh, for multiple years now, multiple administrations, I, I would argue, uh, in all three countries, not, not just Guatemala, um, but I would also say that that in order to carry out politics successfully, if you're a politician in one of these countries, uh, you ultimately have to contend with the fact that you have to be willing to accommodate sort of the ever-present criminal elements. Um, you know, not, not only um, are politicians have to rely on campaign funding, which in, in many instances comes from criminal elements, um, but they also have to contend with the fact that uh, they do not have the, the tools to really confront certainly not at the local level, uh, and at the, at the presidential level, at the federal level, um, there's you know, all sorts of reasons um, underneath that entire structure where there's going to be stops along the way that are easily corruptible. There's too many junctures, essentially, where it's easily corruptible. And criminal organizations, certainly Mexican criminal organizations and, and Central American criminal organizations, have been very, very, very good at figuring out what are the weakest points and filling those vacuums and slowly infiltrating the state. Now, I think that something important to point out is that the state in many sense, in a sense, has, has been complicit. Uh, they have allowed this to occur, um, but at the same time, there's a sort of uh, legacy, uh, I guess, which touches back on, on, on the historical, uh, abbreviated historical narrative, which is that there are 
there were several reasons why this came about. It wasn't just uh, corrupt politicians. Uh, it's, it's more complex. Um, now, I would argue that um, I and, and other individuals would argue that this has sort of brought us to a tipping point uh, where the state is systematically uh, unable to counter criminal pressure, to counter criminal organizations and logistics, um, despite best in intentions, despite uh, funding from CARSI, uh, despite any number of reasons um, that, that may be in their favor. And what has occurred is that the prevailing mood, locally speaking, in these essential banking countries, has been that fighting criminal groups has largely failed. And, and that what, it, what is needed is uh, to refocus efforts instead towards violence reduction. And this is both applicable, applicable to Central America as it is to Mexico, where the tune of politics is, has changed to this nonviolence as opposed to confrontation of, of cartels or criminal groups. Now, I, I would say that this is not really, Mexico excluded, again, back to Central America, I would say that this is, in, in fact, led not to a failed state. Uh, I, I think some, you know, certain individuals try to say that these states have failed, but I, I would rather make the, the case that it has led to weak but functional states. The state is still there, and there is no part in Central America where there's a complete lack of power. Uh, there's, no, there's no vacuum anywhere. It's just different groups um, are now operating alongside the state, in many cases co-opting the state, or in many cases in league with certain parts of the state. Uh, and what that, that result means that the state is, hasn't disappeared. Um, in fact, it's still there. Now, I think a good example for this um, could be, for example, the truce in El Salvador uh, with, with uh, tier three groups, in this case, the, the, the truce between uh, sort of the government, MS-13 and uh, M-18, uh, um, where so the state has argued that the focus should be in reducing violence and that maintaining, and you know, has maintained that, that trafficking is really a local problem, meaning narco menudeo, local retail drug sales, um, but recedes entirely, the state has receded entirely or given up its uh, right to, to fight the criminal organizations in the interest of reducing violence. Now, of course, criminal organizations always find, uh, you know, that when the state recedes, they move into that space. And I think more dangerously, the result of the sort of this tactic has resulted in a situation where um, reducing violence equals a political tool, because now groups realize that if they if they don't if they're not um, you know carrying out you know very public atrocities, uh, they can use that as a bargaining chip, you know, on a table with the government, um, which sort of brings us into to a complicated, you know, even more complicated situation. Uh, I think one one final thought that, that I'd like to share um, or at least point out um, is is perhaps indicative on on the direction in which. Uh, in which I see Latin America moving. And this slide here specifically is for Guatemala and its homicide rates uh, in Guatemala for the last uh, five or six years. Um, now, in 2011, uh, crime, at least homicides, had been dropping. And again, of course, you know, statistics are, you know, whether you trust them or not, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an entirely different conversation. But let's assume that, that these are, if not accurate, at least indicative of the trend. Um, the current president, Otto Pérez Molina, uh, was elected in 2011 on a mano dura uh, platform, meaning um, you know, a, a strong hand against uh, crime. Now, we see an uptick in 2012. Uh, and now, the government has still continued to hold this mano dura approach. And there's this growing appetite uh, in Central America and in, in, in the region uh, to change tracks. And so, you know, here, I, I just leave you with the question because I wonder um, if this uptick in violence will then serve uh, as fodder, political fodder, down the road to, to change that approach. Because clearly, uh, you know, the, the, the argument that, that the current tactic has failed is fairly strong. Um, the problem that I see is that the alternative uh, is not necessarily a better one. So with that, I, I think I've pretty much touched on all the points that, that I wanted to go over. Um, so, Jay, I, I guess uh, you'll step in now and uh, manage the questions.
Great, yeah, and uh, thank you, Eduardo. That was that was wonderful. The uh, and while our guests are entering their questions in the chat box at the bottom of their screen, uh, there, there's just a couple that have floated across my email as we've been speaking. Um, with the with the death of uh, Miguel Morales and the, the Zetas, uh, how is that impacting the the trafficking in Central America? Has his brother, uh, I think it's uh, Omar, uh, has he taken up the mantle? How's that impacting the the trafficking of, of, of both weapons and uh, skills? Well, that, that's certainly the question in everybody's mind. Uh, I've actually been asked the question recently. Uh, and it's a bit early to really tell what's going on. I think that the connection with the local Transportista networks uh, was largely a personal relationship that uh, Trevino uh, had, uh, not necessarily that his brother had. In fact, uh, Lascano, uh, who died or about a year now, I think a little bit more than a year, uh, also did not have that connection. It was largely Trevino that had that connection. Uh, and so by taking him out, I'm unsure if, it's, if that's going to be actually very disruptive because at the end of the day, you know, the point that I've got to try to make is that the Transportista networks are businesses. And so whether they're, whether they're dealing with their direct POC from, uh, within an organization or they're dealing with the person that has sort of taken the, the mantle, um, I don't, I don't, believe that that has that much of an impact. Um, I, I think there's, there's enough, there's a profitable enough relationship between the Zetas and their particular allies in the region uh, to justify a continued relationship. Now, what happened, I, I, I think the question really needs to be more focused on what's going to happen to the Zetas in Mexico and whether they're going to be able to consolidate their position in Mexico. Because ultimately, it doesn't really matter if they have their allies in Central America still strong in selling the product and, and you know, transporting for them. If they can't get it across the country in Mexico, then you know, it's, it's a moot point for them. Um, so that, that's, I think, the, the, the direction in which this is going. Uh, I think in a couple of months, we, we may see more developments that may actually speak more to that rather than sort of my uh, quick prediction here. Okay, and uh, again, I encourage our guests to enter their questions in the chat box at the bottom of their screen. Uh, you, you spoke of the measures that are taken to either curtail or control some of this, uh, the, the, the drug violence and the, the export of violence. What kind of impact of, uh, with legalization efforts? Uh, how much impact have they had on the trafficking and the, the criminal environment? Specifically, specifically, is is this really just a political thing, or is there any real effectiveness of legalization efforts? Jay, I, I would argue that it is primarily a political uh, question. Um, let, let me, let, let's consider for a minute that uh, when we speak about legalization, we're primarily speaking about um, Marijuana legalization, not necessarily cocaine legalization. Uh, marijuana, I think, recent estimate, at least the estimates that I remember seeing for from the DEA for uh, profits, for drug cartel profits, was about a fifth. Um, so let's say that you take you take that away from them, a fifth. Uh, if anything, what you'll see is you'll see an uptick in violence because what what happens? Well, all of a sudden they have to share a, a, a smaller pie, uh, and you know there's more likely to be infighting. Uh, so I don't think it's really a solution to violence, at least not immediately. Um, in addition to that, let's now think of cocaine. Well, again, I don't, I don't think that there's any impetus regionally to, to legalize cocaine. Um, but if there were, we need to remember that, again, as I pointed out, the, the local transportista networks have a list of products that they traffic. And it just so happens to be that cocaine happens to be one of them. Uh, you know, there's there's an endless list of things that they could traffic, and so where you know where where the government may close or open one door, well, a window may open or close somewhere else, and so they will they will move, they will adjust. I think, uh, especially if it were to be a gradual situation where one country legalizes and then another country legalizes, um, they will adjust accordingly and just move to to different uh, you know uh, different income, different different things to profit from. Okay, and on that same uh, issue of profit, uh, Major Murray asks here, it says, what is the, the, the cause of the violence rate where in the trafficking countries it, it says it's uh, ten, 10 times higher than in the U.S. where the competition uh, is, 
really uh, much higher. Is the money, is the profits higher in the trafficking distribution or is it then at the point of sale? Well, there's, there's two different points of sale and it depends on which one we're referring to. Um, the point of sale in the United States is very profitable uh, because there's a, an immediate upmark as soon as it crosses the border because that is the most difficult thing to do. That's the most difficult place to cross, right? Um, now, what happens there, uh, recently I attended a, a talk uh, by a Mexican individual uh, who, who had this sort of great chart and it was two triangles uh, where one triangle, it was like, a, like an hourglass where at the middle where the, the, the sort of the, the point of the two triangles meet, you find the Mexican cartels. And that was the, the point where it had the greatest profits. Of course, once it crosses the United States, um, as, as it gets retailed, it gets cut into smaller and smaller pieces being sold to smaller and smaller organizations. And so the cost of, of selling that product is very high, but it is not being carried by a single organization. So the majority of profits is actually coming to where the organization is, you know, it's a chokehold point. Now, if we're talking about local retail, um, it's, it's, there's not much money in that. Um, in fact, many, many occasions, transportistas, will pay the individuals that they use uh, for logistics or whatever, uh, or in many cases, tier one groups will pay tier two groups in cocaine. They will pay them, as, you know, as opposed to money, they'll pay them in cocaine. And of course, they turn that around and, and then sell it in the local drug market. Now, however, you know, Guatemala has one of the lowest cocaine consumption rates in the world, um, at least locally. So there's not much of a market there to begin. There's not much demand to begin with. Uh, and the, the cost of getting that product to that, up to that point is not very high. So there's not that huge upmark that you see. Now, at the same time, we need to consider that once it crosses the United States, the reason for the upmark in, in price is directly related to the difficulty in getting it there. So while you may be selling it for a lot of money, you also spent a lot of money in a very large and complicated structure to get it up to that point. And so the, I think the point that needs to, to be understood is that while gross profits may be very large, net profits aren't necessarily always just as large. Well, and along that same line, uh, Mr. Ramirez down here asks the question that's I think is kind of on everybody's mind uh, and the difference between uh, ideological violence and uh, commercial uh, even if it's illicit and violence. Do you see a growing nexus between the, the VEOs and TCOs? It's, it's not my area of expertise, and, I, and I've seen the argument with, with people that I've worked with, actually. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, Southern Pulse recently collaborated in a study with IBI consultants where you know, there was, at least not the part that we worked on, but part of the same study, uh, there was the, the connection being made between certain trafficking groups uh, and Hezbollah or you know or whichever other group you may want to throw in there that have political motivations behind what they may be doing. Now, again, as I said, it's not necessarily my area of expertise. What I would say is that these transportista networks are, you know, they're going to roll with the highest bidder. And so whether it's to get them parts to make, uh, you know, a, a bomb or whether it's a packet of cocaine or whether it's a piece of cheese or a bag of cardamom, uh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, they're not ideologically motivated groups. They're profit-driven groups. Uh, and of course, because they're criminals uh, and they operate outside of the law, uh, they're very unlikely to A, have any incentive to, you know, or moral code to, to not sell certain things or not transport certain things. Um, and at the same time, there's no oversight. So they'll, they'll transport just about anything. Um, I, yeah, again, I'd say they'll, they'll go with the highest bidder. Um, what uh, you know, what necessarily they may they may be transporting be beyond drugs is difficult to say because um, you know unless they get caught red-handed, uh, you don't have a very good idea unless they share that information openly with you. Okay, and uh, here's, here's a question that kind of loops back around to what we spoke about earlier. With the, the power vacuum at the top of uh, Los Zetas, Zetas uh, do you see them targeting Americans abroad or American forces just for the shock value of it to reestablish dominance or internal positioning for power? Or is it pretty much business as usual? Consolidate. Uh, and take up the reins. Um, 
if he does, I think it'll be business as usual. The Zetas don't necessarily gain anything uh, from overtly or publicly attacking American forces or attacking, um, you know, without, a, you know, it, obviously if, if, if there's an operation uh, that is, inter, you, know, you know, sort of an introduction operation, there's obviously going to be a firefight, but uh, there is little to gain from a publicity stunt, which is that they're very, you know, they're very fond of publicity stunts uh, from doing that, because, I mean, if anything, uh, that's, that, you know, that's unwanted attention, really. Um, so, what happens if, if Seta Quarantias, I think is Omar, um, if he's unable to consolidate power, then I think you may see an uptick in violence against government forces or U.S. forces or, you know, whatever, or what have you. Um, because you may have uh, sort of a situation where uh, the individual at the top is not really in control of, of the cells beneath him. Uh, and there may, be, there may be competing interests. And so if you get into this sort of complicated game of, you know, what, what, may, be what may be convenient or uh, advantageous for one particular cell may not be necessary for the other one. And so you, you sort of get into territory, which is the what if kind of territory of, uh, you know, the very local complicated intricacies of, of, of that. Again, my, my, at least my assumption um, is that it will continue to be business as usual. At least it has been for the last uh, couple of months. I, I, you know, we haven't registered any particular change in the way that they're operating. They're still doing the same thing they do. In, in a question that's kind of related to that, do you see, and, and, and this is just speculation, do you see that they might uh, actually downtick their operations, their activities, and let uh, the U.S argument over the border, uh, kind of let the border loosen up a little bit uh, so that they would actually have more uh, access and flow, particularly in the areas out by out by the Pacific, by the Baja. I mean, it's very possibly. Uh, it's very possible. I mean, there's two things. Uh, first, uh, particularly to the Zetas, because I mean, it seems that the discussion is very centered around the Zetas and not so much the Sinaloa Federation. Uh, the Zetas don't, their lion's share of profit doesn't necessarily come from cocaine smuggling. Uh, I think, I can't remember the percentages, but it's, I think it's less than half. Um, they and, it, and certain cells specifically rely very largely on extortion money, uh, on fuel theft, uh, on, on sort of inverse trafficking, where they steal, for example, gasoline in the in Mexico from Pemex pipelines and then sell it downstream in Guatemala. I think I think it's like thirty percent of gasoline you buy in Guatemala, at least the government claims that uh, has has been sourced from <laughs> illegally. So. You know, they, they, they're in a position where they can, uh, or at least I, I assume that they can, um, as you say, backtrack a little bit in terms of trafficking, sort of let that sit for a while, uh, and just, you know, turn up the heat on certain other areas where they, where they put profit. Um, ultimately, I, you know, I think the violence that we see I mean, obviously, violence at you know, the border is always on, mostly on the Mexican side. If if we do see violence within the United States um, or you know at the border, it's it's generally when when something has gone awry in their mind, in in, in the drug trafficker's mind, uh, he wants his product to get across without a problem. Um, and so, you know, the strategy will be whatever gets them there. Um, if there are no stressing factors, such as a, a competing group, for example. Um, we're unlikely to see much, much change there. What, one thing that I, that I think is important to, to note, uh, especially around the Nuevo Laredo area, Monterey area, uh, is that the, the, the Gulf Cartel has sort of made a little bit of a comeback. Now, they had a sort of a setback recently with, with that arrest, but uh, you know, I, I think in many ways um, that fight is still not over. And so I think even though violence levels in northern states, the Mexican northern states, have dropped significantly. I, I don't think I don't see the full light light at the end of the tunnel yet. Great, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to apologize to all of our guests that have had trouble getting on. Uh, DCO has been a bit dodgy uh, this morning and this week. Uh, sir, do you have any closing thoughts? The big thoughts that you'd like to leave with us? Absolutely. I, I think there's one particular thing that that I'd really like to drive across, and that's that. Trafficking in Central America and in, in, in Mexico uh, is a very, very complex issue. Uh, and I think often it's, it's tempting to sort of, you know, with broad brush strokes, uh, paint, you know, this group controls this area, this group does this and that, when the reality is completely, you know, considerably more complex and nuanced. Uh, 
Um, and I think, you know, ultimately, what I'd like to drive to is, is that that complexity and those nuances that we need to understand um, are, are, are really, really, really important in understanding what's going on and in understanding what policy decisions that are being made locally in the United States, uh, what their effect of those policies are. Um, I think I'd like to, I'll, I'll leave it at that, I think.